My name is Harsha Mohan. I am, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, so I apologize for starting a little bit late. Can everybody hear me? Just making sure. Sure can. Cool. And can y'all see my screen as well? Yep. Okay, sick. So, yeah, just as I said, hey guys, I'm Harsha. Um, it's my pleasure to be part of the National Executive Board for Sling Health. Over the past month, as you know, um, we've had the pleasure of recruiting some of the brightest teams and mentors across the country and all to come together and build solutions to the COVID crisis. So thank you everyone who's participated. It has been truly inspiring for all of us to see you guys grow and really develop solutions into something that can hopefully be meaningful to our communities. So without further ado, uh, I just wanted to play this video by um, Mario, and we will get started shortly after that. Good evening, everyone. I hope you and your families are all well and safe. My name is Mario Russo, and I'm the president of Sling Health. Sling Health is a national network of biotechnology accelerators centered in major cities and large universities around the country that aims to impact medicine while training the future of innovators. And especially in times like these, there has been no greater need for innovators primed to make a difference in healthcare than now. And so thank you for joining us in the setting of COVID for the showcase of our budding student-led companies from across our network. Tonight, you'll be able to see what our students have accomplished over the course of the past year, even through quarantine. And we do encourage you to get in touch with the teams for further conversations if you're interested or find you can make an impact on their companies. Before we showcase the teams, I want to do a brief introduction into Sling Health and our national program. Like I mentioned, Sling Health not only trains students to innovate, but is also run by student leaders from across the country. I, myself, am a medical student studying at Harvard and graduated with a degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Michigan. And you'll find similar stories to mine across the board from our leaders. All of us are brought together by a passion to make an impact in medicine. Sling Health is founded on solving this problem, a disconnect between students who have the skills and drive to solve problems but don't have the exposure to the clinical setting, and medical professionals that witness and grapple with these problems but don't have the time or technical expertise to solve them. Sling Health bridges this gap by engaging with and collecting pressing clinical problems from medical professionals and providing teams of students the resources and training necessary to form lasting solutions. Our program runs with the school year, and in a typical year, usually capstones in our national demo day competition. Our experiential platform facilitates the formation of student teams around those pressing clinical problems before leading them through the entire innovation process. Throughout their development, we make sure to have our teams engage with key stakeholders to hone the solutions, and we also have checkpoints or design reviews with entrepreneurs and experts to gather the feedback they need to accelerate forward. By the end of the year, many of our teams are ready to push forward with their startups. Here you can see pictures from our previous national demo days. And this is just a selection of over 20 startups that we've spun out, all started by students that have raised over $18 million in investments. And this, like I said, is possible because of the efforts pushed by student leaders at chapters around the country. And so if you'd like to get involved, mentor, partner, or think a Sling Health chapter should be brought to your local institution, please email me at the following email on the slide. And like I said, please feel free to get in touch with the teams following tonight's showcase. Um, you can see on this slide that there is a QR code that we'll be showcasing um, throughout the presentations tonight. You can just scan that and you'll be led to a form to help get in contact with these students. And with that said, there's nothing left to do but to show you what some of our top teams have developed this year. I'd like to congratulate them all on a great year of hard work, and I'd like to thank all of you for your time tonight. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, and so before we get started, uh, I would like to thank our mentors. I've personally been on the design reviews with them, watching the mentors give very insightful feedback. 
And thank you so much to the mentors for helping shape the participants' growth. We also wanna thank the judges shown here uh, for helping us select the top three teams who will be receiving funding to continue their work. We had six of our own exec board members screen the first round and 12 other judges make the final pick for three of the top seven. And finally, we'd like to thank all of you, the participants for taking part in the Sling Health Bootcamp. Uh, as I just said, we will be selecting three winners from our top seven today, but Sling Health will continue to support you wherever you go next. Remember, we are a national network, so please leverage us in connecting you and your team to the closest or to the closest resources. Sorry. And last announcement before we get started, I will be dropping this in the chat, but please fill out the exit survey. Uh, let me just drop this in the chat right here. And we are incentivizing the exit survey with a $5 Amazon credit. Awesome. So without further ado, uh, let's get started and watch our first team, Wing Health. with the story of someone we talked to. And we are enabling hyperlocal telehealth access in neighborhood. I'm Stephen Greenwich, and we are Wing Health. Wing Health connects individuals to virtual care with nearby health professionals at a hyperlocal level. I want to start off with the story of someone we talked to named Edna. Edna's retired and usually receives care from a nearby community health center. She's been sheltering at home because she knows she's high risk. She isn't sure where to get the health care she needs because her usual center is closed. Her friend from church, who's been seeing her own doctor through a video call, helps Edna navigate the changing landscape and connect with a new provider through a virtual visit for the first time. Edna was able to get the care she needs. Edna was lucky to have a friend guide her to a virtual care provider, but there's so many others out there who don't have such a friend to help them. And this is a huge problem. Patients cannot access local and trusted providers for contextual care due to the disruption caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Individuals are unaware about how to access local community health centers that have started offering virtual care services. Existing telemedicine services can provide remote care during shelter in place. However, these services were not designed for people from more vulnerable populations and lower income populations like Edna who visit community health centers. Current telemedicine implementation threatens to exacerbate the health disparities that existed before COVID-19 and have only been amplified by this crisis. The financial impact of over a 50% decrease in visits to community health centers is deeply troubling. Community centers are having trouble sourcing patients to their new telehealth offerings. They weren't able to reimburse for telehealth services until March. No reimbursement meant no prioritization, meaning no existing virtual care workflows or infrastructure for these clinics. The Wing Health solution provides an assistant that helps individuals discover local and trusted telehealth providers and the resources they need to access these providers. By doing so, we source new and existing patients to providers that are struggling to make ends meet. Our conversational agent automates the process of bringing together individuals and providers. Our solution is rooted in the lower income and vulnerable populations bearing the brunt of this crisis. Our solution addresses the disparities in telemedicine access and mitigates barriers to digital literacy and the resources needed to engage in video visits. Here are some wireframes that showcase our solution. As you can see, our conversational agent guides individuals to local Wi-Fi hotspots, affordable data plans, local tech hubs where they can pick up refurbished devices, and also connects them to primary care providers at community health centers in their community for a scheduled appointment. The impact here is quite large. There are over 14,000 federally qualified health centers, also known as FQHCs, a type of community care center in the USA. One in 12 people in the US rely on an FQHC for care. Over 40% of those who seek care at an FQHC are Medicaid beneficiaries. And 10 to 20 million people will sign on to Medicaid in the coming months. The market size reflects this impact. With a TAM of 20 billion, individuals with smartphones making up a SAM of 14 billion, and the SOM of my local community in San Francisco at 23 million. Among our competition, Wing Health is the only solution that is telehealth first, hyperlocal, focused on vulnerable and lower income populations, sources patients, and includes a conversational agent. The Wing Health business model acts as a marketplace that connects providers to patients 
while capturing a commission for each reimbursed encounter. Providers will also pay to be included in our service. Our go to market plan consists of paid advertising by targeting specific demographics through social media. Our unpaid advertising will focus on partnering with community leaders that patients trust from churches, youth groups, food banks, and nonprofit organizations who can advertise on our behalf and get our solution into these communities. We will also implement a patient referral program. Our upcoming roadmap consists of launching our MVP in San Francisco and later on this year, expanding to more practices in California, sourcing additional clinics, and developing our automated conversational agents. Later on, we'll expand to other cities such as Detroit and Las Vegas, expand beyond primary care, and further refine our automated capabilities. We have our uh, initial MVP live at wing.health, where we currently manually connect patients to providers. Our team met at the MIT COVID-19 challenge. I'm Steven, and I bring career experience building telemedicine solutions and digital health products. Jinzi is a pediatrician and medical director of innovation, quality, and research at Nevada Health Centers. Nikhil is pursuing a medical degree at Wayne State University School of Medicine, where he researches telehealth efficacy. We are Wing Health, and we are enabling hyperlocal telehealth access in neighborhoods, towns, and cities. Thank you so much, and please reach out if you have any questions. Awesome. Uh, just to reiterate, that was Team One Wing Health, and they're enabling hyperlocalized telehealth access for communities while addressing the national shortage of available healthcare providers. Now, Team Two. Next up, we have Team Two which is Nightingale, and Nightingale connects nurses to caregivers and patients to close the home health care gap. We are Nightingale. Our mission is to connect nurses to caregivers to close the home health care gap. We're an interdisciplinary team that originally formed out of Stanford's biodesign program. We have a diverse set of backgrounds in medicine, business, entrepreneurship, user design, health policy, and hardware and software engineering. And our advisory board has decades of experience in home care, caregiving, and venture. We aim to close the home health care gap. There are 13 million patients and growing in home health care and only about 50,000 nurses to serve them. That's about one nurse to every 300 patients. COVID has exacerbated this gap with more and more patients being pulled out of the hospitals and skilled nursing facilities and put into home care. And it has exacerbated the skilled nursing shortage with many nurses being quarantined, furloughed, or laid off. Even though nine out of 10 patients would prefer to get care in the home, and even though home care leads to improved outcomes and reduced costs, the home care industry in the US is on the verge of collapse. And COVID, has crippled the already fragile home care workforce with likely long lasting effect. At the same time, we've seen rapid adoption of telemedicine and relaxation of regulations in that space. Shelter in place requirements have also put more family members at home with loved ones. This means that caregivers have a new level of responsibility, but in these times they're not receiving the same coaching that they ordinarily would. So to, so to resolve this home care crisis, we've developed Nightingale, which is a three-part platform. First, it's an online marketplace that matches nurses to caregivers and their patients. Once a nurse is matched with a caregiver and their patient, it launches into a video chatting service where the nurse will coach a caregiver through performing a basic procedure on a patient, such as administering medication or changing a wound dressing. We're also developing assistive accessories in the medium term to help facilitate this care. We've talked to over 50 stakeholders in this space, and they have validated our value proposition. For nurses, Nightingale provides an income opportunity that allows them to work flexibly and safely from home. For caregivers and patients, it reduces anxiety and keeps them healthy and prevents the spread of disease. For health systems, it reduces readmissions and prevents the spread of disease in hospitals, and it also more efficiently allocates their workforce. We are the only solution in our competitive landscape focused on nursing, coaching, and caregiving. Our business model is simple. We would take $5 or 20% of every $25, 30-minute appointment. We see great potential in, in uh, providing our service direct to consumers or B2C, but in the short run, we're focused on the B2B2C market selling into healthcare systems, particularly those with managed care plans. 
We projected a TAM of 2.4 billion. That takes uh, into account 40 million patients who need assistance, multiplied by our take rate of $5, and multiplied by an average 12 appointments per year. We narrowed that down to the population of patients who are formally in home care, in home care and who have smartphone technology necessary to use our application to get us to a $624 million SAM. Our go-to-market strategy starts with a health system pilot. We have interest from Intermountain Healthcare in Utah, which is doing home care for over 60 years and has over 130,000 patients. Once we launch a successful pilot with Intermountain, we plan to convert a portion of their patient population into paying customers. From there, we would pivot D to C and build the supply side of the marketplace by reaching out to nursing associations, retired part-time and quarantine nurses, and we would acquire users through digital marketing and through reaching out to home care and caregiving associations. We've already developed an MVP, and here's our timeline for the next six months. Right now, we're focused on user testing and over the next few weeks, developing our proposal for a pilot with Intermountain. Um, once we launch our pilot and uh, successfully demonstrate improved outcomes and reduce costs, we'll scale from there. Thank you so much to the Sling Bootcamp. We are Nightingale. We are excited to be at the forefront of a paradigm shift in medicine from a model that is focused on treating illness in a, a fee-for-service way in hospitals to one that is focused on being value-based, preventative, and providing care to the patient where they want it most, which is in the home. Thank you. Awesome. Up next, we have team three, which is Compass. And Compass is a triaging platform designed to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 in dense, low-income population centers. We are Compass, an SMS-based telemedicine platform aiming to mitigate the disproportionate effects of the coronavirus in dense, low-income populations. COVID-19 has spread rapidly in low-income populations for a plethora of reasons, and the best preventative measure for mitigating this spread is triaging. After speaking to public health experts, however, we realized that current triaging systems are ineffective in these low-income populations because they fail to address how a person can get tested after receiving a diagnosis. This is because many people lack insurance or Medicaid in Missouri, and most triaging systems fail to provide resources after they receive a risk diagnosis. Our solution addresses this problem by creating a technical and operational workflow that can be rapidly implemented with the help of our partners. Our technical workflow includes an SMS system built through Twilio. The responses to our questions are used to assess risk. These responses are securely stored, maintaining HIPAA compliance through an Azure database. The patient is then given a unique code they can present at a partnering testing center. On the back end, what makes our platform unique is the operational workflow. We partner with local testing centers and enter into an agreement such that any person who comes into their testing center, regardless of their insurance or Medicaid status, can get tested. Second, we also partner with local housing communities where we can disseminate our number and commercialize our platform. Finally, we will pilot the platform. Our, sol our solution is uniquely beneficial because it helps housing centers organize testing. It is simple to use because most people have an SMS capable device and it addresses how a patient can get tested. For our revenue generating strategy, we are first going to provide a set of services at a fixed cost that housing communities can agree on. We will then generate revenue from charging a discounted fee for some of those, for those same charges. We're using a B2B model for generating revenue. We will also be acquiring uh, funding from the city block funding grants. Note all, all revenue is used to sustain our platform since it costs money to keep running. In terms of market potential and commercial strategy, nationally there are over 10,000 housing community self, uh, shelters with a market size of $14 billion. Locally, we plan on implementing with over 50 housing shelters. We will, we will better understand how much revenue we can generate after our initial pilot test and cost analysis. Finally, to increase our reach nationally, we will be working with student groups at Stanford, Columbia, MIT, and professionals at Luminaire. We have already implemented our project with Affinia. Initially, we will only be providing referrals to the Affinia Testing Center. However, once we will eventually integrate it with their EHR system to simplify documentation and build in a feature that allows users to schedule testing appointments through the SMS platform. 
essentially condensing their testing workflow. Now, we have already finished a product and uh, launched a website as well. Um, we have implemented with Athenia across five of their testing centers, and we have a meeting with United Way in the coming week to discuss large-scale implementation throughout St. Louis. We, have, we also have a meeting scheduled with FCHC, Family Care Health Centers, to discuss uh, implementing within their local testing centers as well. These are our partners that have helped us support the implementation of our product and helped us, de helped us develop it as well. And the appendix section answers uh, with, with the section of common questions contains uh, things like HIPAA compliance, accessibility, legality, and liability, and scale. Now we can move on to a short demo video. The Compass platform is easy to use and was constructed using Twilio, an SMS API to generate automated responses. All you have to do is text our number and answer specific questions we have designed with our partnering testing center and physicians. Compass provides a recommendation whether you should or shouldn't visit the clinic. Briefly shown is also the inner flow we created using uh, Twilio. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> Next up, we have Team 7, Auxilia. And Auxilia is a simple removable desiccant strip designed to attach on the interior of N95 masks to double its effective use life. We're coming up on just halfway here for through the video pitches. Hello everyone, we're Team 7 from the University of Toronto and the design we'll introduce you today aims to address the problem caused by the extended usage of N95 masks due to the critical PPE shortages. To start off, I'd like to introduce Dr. Teresa Allen, an infectious disease specialist working at St. Michael's Hospital. During a normal day in her work, she'll visit her patients to make sure they're doing okay and intubate patients if needed. Usually, after attending each patient, she'll change her N95 mask to avoid cross-contamination. But with the COVID pandemic, her hospital is experiencing critical shortages of N95 masks so she has no other choice but to wear the same mask throughout her shift. Dr. Allen finds that as time goes on, the humidity of the mask increases, making her increasingly hard to breathe. What we just introduced is the problem experienced by our end users. Now, let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. The problem we're dealing here has multiple levels. It started with the broken supply chain, which leads to the shortages of critical PPE including the N95 mask. This then forces providers to wear the same mask for an extended period of time. As a result, water condensate from excel breath accumulates and ultimately causes increased breathing resistance and compromised filter inefficiency, which placed our healthcare providers under the risk of infection. To further demonstrate the gravity of the problem, the national survey shows that 60% of the hospitals indicated that they struggle to admit new patients due to the lack of PPE, while 97% of the providers voiced their concerns about the infective protection from the N95 mask after an extended period of usage. And this is where our design auxilia comes in, and we aim to address the problem at the level of moisture condensation. We developed two criteria for our design being effective and user-friendly. As you can see from this matrix, the current existing design are either ineffective to remove the moisture or are difficult to use. For example, the Honeywell design even requires an extra compartment to drain the water collected by the desiccant material. So there exists a gap for a design that is both simple and effective. And again, this is where Auxilia comes in. Our design consists of an adhesive desiccant strip that can be easily attached and removed from the start and end of user shift. Here you see a drawing of different layers of the desiccant strip with the silica gel wrap in the middle. So here's how our design works. The XL breath comes out of our mouth and hits the desiccant strip. As the XL layer travels through the strip, a portion of the water will be absorbed by the desiccant. And as the airstream leaves the desiccant and hits the first layer of the mask, it becomes much drier and will transfer much little water to the mask compared to before. So you might wonder, 
how effective our design really is. Well, according to a study from Naoshi, an N95 mask alone can only last for four hours before the exhaled moisture dampens its filter and starts to deteriorate its filtering efficiency. But with our design auxilia attached, we can extend this line to eight hours. Essentially, our design doubles the effective use life of N95 mask. Now let's look at the potential market. Our design has a sustainable future even after the pandemic. Even though the quantities of the mask used for medical purpose will decrease, there still exists a pool of growing occupation, such as construction and mining industry, where N95 masks will be used for over four hours. We're aiming to sell one auxilia strip for each mask produced. With two billion masks produced globally at a retail price of two US dollars for each strip, our market size is estimated to be at least four billion US dollars to start with. Even if we don't capture the entire market, just 10% of it is still a considerable amount. Here we show the marketing strategy as we will use to implement our design and bring it towards the market. We plan to first reach out to laboratories with facilities to help us perform testing for product validation as well as getting regulatory approval for commercialization. We also aim to work with lawyers to buy a professional and utility patent. We also aim to joint venture with industry partners and material suppliers who have proper facility to help us build prototypes and mass produce the product and deliver them to hospitals, either through bulk purchases or retail sales. To conclude, our design auxilia is a simple yet powerful design that has great potential for both converting to market value and mitigating the shortages of N95 mask. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Next up, we have Team 9, Project Alloy, and they have designed a logistical triage portal that can help connect hospitals community-based organizations and isolation centers to non-government organizations, government welfare groups, and even to manufacturers. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The word alloy implies the amalgamation of materials to make something better. Project Alloy aims to do the same by creating a need-centric approach to allocating healthcare resources in crisis situations. And who are we doing this for? We're doing it for the brave doctors, nurses, paramedics, janitors, and volunteers who show up every day even if they don't have the equipment to protect themselves. As we delved into supply chain obstacles surrounding access to protective equipment and other resources, we found that the cumulative bio burden due to exposure on healthcare providers puts them at significant risk if proper equipment is not available. In addition, we found an urgent heart-wrenching need for real-time need-based resource allocation and distribution due to the lack of a centralized and effective communication and information sharing platform. Armed with our solution, we checked to ensure that we weren't simply reinventing the wheel and found that existing solutions were limited in that they were primarily either intra-hospital or intra-consortium only. There was minimal hospital to donor connectivity and especially for smaller clinics and rural hospitals, there was no significant link to manufacturers and no established supply chain network for them to tap into. This therefore allowed us to add value with our platform in the following ways. We aim to be healthcare provider centric. We want to provide rapid real-time access to a centralized communication network to ensure equitable distribution of critical resources. And for the first three months, we aim to provide this service free of cost to enable hospitals and suppliers to benefit from this during the peak of the crisis. We therefore created a portal that could connect hospitals, community-based organizations and isolation centers to suppliers in the form of NGOs, government agencies, and even to manufacturers. And this was built on the premise presented in WHO's paper, a part of which we aim to focus on coordinating PPE supply chain primarily. In our platform, therefore, hospitals can input data about their stocks, their utilization, and the acute deficiencies they are, that they are facing. And this is input in, into a dashboard, which is visualized by suppliers, who can then respond to these needs by selling or donating their products. Hospitals, through our e-commerce marketplace, can also reach out to these suppliers themselves to request or negotiate prices for critical supplies. This would allow us to become that one-stop shop for healthcare resources, both during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, to allow for us to model a crisis management platform that can be used both during this pandemic and in future crises as well. When we, were, when we discuss technology and how we integrate into our platform revolves around the 2080 rule, 20% 20 effort for 80% outcome. And we've created a Google Data Studio dashboard and a shared tribe marketplace to enable the creation of this website. How it works is that when you sign into projectalloy.org, 
you are sent to a centralized bird's eye view dashboard, which gives a snapshot picture of the overall deficiencies across all hospitals in the network. It also provides manufacturers and suppliers with information about the projections that they would need to accommodate or the weekly utilization rates that would allow them to project the needs that may be required in two weeks or four weeks, and they can accommodate their production and supplies accordingly. We also facilitate a more granular view into specific hospitals' needs, where hospitals can list their stocks and deficiencies and can, or, and can be reached out to through the contact information provided. On the other side, we've also created a supplier uh, e-commerce platform, which allows hospitals and individuals to reach out and order or negotiate prices. And in this, we also built in a verified button, which would show that these specific suppliers are the ones who have gone through and have agreed to our terms of reference to ensure the quality of their product. From an implementation point of view, we aim to leverage and utilize the 600 plus volunteer network of our umbrella organization, the Student Task Force Against COVID, and we have already trained them and have deployed them to onboard hospitals, onboard suppliers, manage the backend technology, and begin outreach in print and digital media to expand the platform and to engage our users more holistically. And we have already created a database of 50 users, including large scale suppliers in this area. Our timeline and milestones, therefore, range from starting to integrate users onto the platform move on to integrating online payment abilities into our app, and then integrating machine learning and APIs to improve the user experience and integrate inventory, ma inventory management systems into the platform as well. In terms of a sustainability model, we, are, we will transition from a non-profit donation run model for which we have received $1,600 worth of funding to a fee-for-service model, as well as integrate commission percentages from in-app payment and transfers once that ability has been integrated into the platform. This will allow us to transition from non-profit to a social entrepreneurship or for-profit B2B and B2C model. However, we realize that we can't exist in isolation and we have already begun discussions with local hospitals, NGOs, volunteer agencies to create a network that we can utilize as well as reach out to international organizations who are giants in e-commerce to facilitate the expansion of our supplier network as well. What this therefore requires is a certain amount of funding. Specifically in Q1, we're looking for approximately $6,000 worth of funding, and that transitions up to $15,000 by the end of Q4. The question therefore arises, why Alloy? Because we tick all the boxes. There's a real need. We are a simple solution. And as you can see, we are wanted. We can rapidly occupy and improve an untapped niche in resource allocation to ensure the safety of the brave heroes at the front lines. Thank you so much. Awesome. Cool. Next up. We have ADCOM, and ADCOM is a two-piece oxygen mask designed to fit around any oral tube and capture infectious particles when removing the said tube, thus protecting hospital staff from disease transmission. I'm going to take it away. Hello, my name is Imran Zafar, and today I'll be presenting our product called the Aerosolized Droplet Capture and Oxygenation Mask, or the ADCO mask. We've developed this to minimize disease transmission during high-risk extubations. So consider this, you're an ICU physician and the time has come to take your COVID patient off the ventilator. You're glad they're ready to start breathing on their own, but you're also concerned and anxious about the procedure. You know that as you pull the endotracheal tube out, your patient's going to gag, cough, and spit, all of this causing aerosolization of droplets, putting you at risk. So you begin to consider your options. Extubating under a plastic drape is one, but there's no seal, so no guarantee that droplets won't escape into the surrounding space, putting the efficacy in question. And it uses layers of plastic, which is wasteful. A plastic box is another, but this restricts your range of mo motion so you can easily damage the airway while extubating. And if the patient begins to crash, you'll have to remove the box, which is time consuming and defeats the purpose of worker protection. So there's a reduced capacity for intervention if needed. Finally, you can use a mask to cover the patient's face and remove the tube from its central hole. But this requires the mask to be slipped over the tube, meaning the tube has to be disconnected from the ventilator first, which poses an aerosolization risk. So we believe there's room for innovation for this clinical problem. The solution we're presenting to you today is a mask with all the normal ports of a mask, including the ability to detach an oxygen source and measure exhaled carbon dioxide. Also, we've added a central hole for an ET tube to be pulled out through. A seal. The central hole forms a good seal around whatever tube is passing through it and maintains a seal once the tube has been completely removed. This minimizes the number of infective particles that escape from inside the mask. A suction port. We're capturing aerosolized particles by using commonly available bedside vacuum outlets as a tool to our advantage. And it's modular, a two-piece design. We're able to put this mask on a patient who's already intubated without disconnecting the tube. We've developed it in a way that it comes together securely with an ET tube traveling through the central hole. We've developed a mask that incorporates all of these features and executes them elegantly under the umbrella of safety. Essentially, we've designed it with a safety-first approach for the healthcare workers who will use it. This is our model in its current iteration. 
You'll note specific features like the central hole to accommodate an ET tube and the two-piece clip-on design, and also some of the standard ports we mentioned for appropriate oxygen delivery and monitoring. Additionally, we've incorporated a soft lining to maintain a comfortable seal with the patient's face. Retrospectively, our design would have been helpful for protecting healthcare workers during outbreaks of the past 15 years. In the current public health climate, there are over 68,000 cases of COVID-19 in healthcare workers in the U.S., with over 350 deaths in this group. This is unacceptable. We've developed this mask to protect healthcare workers during this pandemic and for future ones. Beyond global health instabilities, we anticipate this mask being used in patients who are infected with a number of respiratory diseases, including TB, pneumonia, and influenza. So talking about the scope, we anticipate buyers to be organizations like hospitals, clinics, and surgery centers, and we expect end users to be ICU doctors, anesthesiologists, CRNAs, and respiratory therapists. And regarding immediate utility, most of the data from the U.S. is centered around the New York City area, which shows that about 20% of patients required intubation and mechanical ventilation. In addition to its primary use for high-risk extubations, we've investigated other uses for this mask. It can be utilized in any situation where there's a need to emergently ventilate a patient, especially when there's a scope inside a body cavity that can't be removed quickly due to the delicate space. In procedures like bronchoscopies and endoscopies, we can attach the mask over the scope and begin ventilating while the procedure continues or the scope is safely removed. Our greatest asset is that we designed this mask with healthcare safety as a priority. Other masks and makeshift solutions that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation each have significant drawbacks, as mentioned, and none enable extubations in a way that minimizes risk and maximizes efficacy. So where do we stand right now? Well, we're securing provisional patent through Sling's partners at Hush Blackwell. Our patent searches have indicated no prior art specific to our design, so we're optimistic about this process. Next, we'll target discoverability of the design with an academic publication in a journal read by the same people who are affected by the situation daily. We also want to host this product on a website so that those who discover it will have a resource for more information and how to get in touch. We'll continue to establish validation for the product through directed interviews and questionnaires. We know there's a strong need for our product, and we want to ensure there's an equally powerful desire to use it and incorporate it in the clinical setting. By accomplishing these four goals, we'll be in a good position to approach a hospital to perform a pilot and proof of concept. Looking ahead, our provisional patent gives us 12 months to push our project to the next stages. We expect our product will be eligible for a Class 1 FDA designation, and we plan to gain FDA clearance and ideally approval as soon as possible. We already have a predicate device in mind to help expedite this process. Next, we'll target government grants for funding through institutions like the NIH. We've deemed grants for public health initiatives as a good fit for us. Finally, we're considering routes of production and are toying with both licensing and independent manufacture. We're working with Proto Labs and Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, to develop insights on the manufacturing process. Our intent is to have the capacity to produce and deliver units within 18 months. And our team is a mix of medical engineering students from across the country. We have experience with biomedical device design and patenting process, as well as significant clinical insight and contacts with established clinicians at academic and community medical centers. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you for your support and consideration in helping us address healthcare worker safety. Excellent. And coming up on our final presenting team, Bicoast Lab or Bicoast Lab, I'm not exactly sure how to say it. Um, and they are developing a customizable virtual laboratory where educators and students can perform real world simulations of experiments for educational or training purposes. In March 2020, because of the coronavirus pandemic, universities had to close their doors. Professors had to scramble to move their classes online. Lab instructors had a unique challenge. How do you do experiments online? Introducing Vika's Labs, a customized virtual laboratory for the life sciences. The shutdown that occurred as a result of the coronavirus pandemic highlighted an unmet short-term need to be able to teach selected laboratories classes online. But even beyond this pandemic, there is a long-term need to create solutions for colleges or universities that do not have the budget to build or maintain laboratories. Laboratory equipment is expensive. So how then do you expose students to the latest technology? There is also the need to supplement the traditional laboratory experience. Some instructors teach classes of up to 300 students. Sometimes students do not understand the lab and have a hard time building the bridge between the concepts and the techniques. Creating the opportunity for them to prepare before the lab by doing the lab virtually and afterwards by going back to the virtual lab to reinforce what they have learned in the physical laboratory will, will enhance their learning tremendously. We have validated these needs by reaching out to lab instructors who have told us that there is a need. 
and that they are interested in the solution. What is the solution? Because Labs. Because Labs is a virtual laboratory for teaching. An example of it is to your left. In Because Labs, professors will design their experiments and students will perform them in a virtual environment with the opportunity to make errors. In some cases, BKIS may replace the lab, as in the coronavirus pandemic. But BKIS is not here to replace the physical laboratory. It is here to supplement it. It can provide students with exposure to new equipment. It can help them re reinforce concepts and techniques, and it can give them an opportunity to practice. The estimated total available market is more than $1 billion. We are designing a product that is customizable and flexible so that it may not only be used by universities for teaching, but it could quickly be used by medical laboratories, for example, for training. Therefore, we believe that our product can also bring value to other markets as listed below here. Our biggest barrier to enter the market may be our competitors. We have four competitors from different countries. Labster is the strongest competitor in the market. Labster was started in Denmark and caters to the European market and it has started to enter the US market. It has $34 million in investments. However, we know we can enter this market because our product is different from what Labster and the other competitors are offering. We are building a product that is customizable and flexible. The product that our competitors offer it's an off-the-shelf product and they have a take-it-or-leave-it approach. Our platform is flexible, is adaptable, not only to teaching but also potentially to training. And we will be the first U.S. virtual lab and that opens us up to funding that our competitors do not have. Our focus will be initially on life sciences. And our competitors right now are focusing on life sciences and other disciplines. We believe that we have a good chance in this market because we have not only a good product, but a very strong team. Our core team consists of Emma Toker, who is a three exit entrepreneur, of Avery Witten, who has an extensive background in lab management, and myself, who have a background in laboratory science and also science in general. We have a team of game developers from MIT developing our proof of concept. We have biology and chemistry professors as, as advisors, and we have educational experts that are going to assist us in developing the product. Thus far, we've reached, we've had a lot of traction. We've formed our team, we've gone through customer validation, we have a conceptualization of the product, we have a proof of concept, which is Western blotting, and we have identified grant opportunities. The next steps will be to continue our customer validation and invest in software resources and apply for the grants and have our proof of concept developed for the grant applications in September. Because Labs, this is the right time, we have a strong team and we think we have the right market that needs us and we have the solution. Thank you. Excellent. Well, that wraps up all of the presentations we have. Remember, uh, I wanted to reiterate that if you are interested in contacting us to start a chapter at your university, please scan this QR code and we'd be happy to get in contact. Or you can email Mario or myself at russo at slinghealth.org or harsha at slinghealth.org. And this wraps up the event. I really, really want to thank, say thank you to everybody who participated. Um, there was, I, at least for me personally, there, it was a huge opportunity for leadership growth and also realizing that virtual logistics is really hard. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have received the final feedback from the judges. And so virtual drum roll, drum roll please. Our third place winner is team 14, ADCOM. In second place, we have team 18, Bicos Labs. And one more drum roll please for the overall winner of the Sling Health COVID-19 Bootcamp is Team 2, Team Nightingale. Finally, we want to thank you again to, for tuning in. Please contact us if you're interested in working together in the future, and I hope everybody has a great day. Again, I wanted to reiterate that just because your team did not win, that does not predict the future success of your team or your idea. Uh, this was simply, this was subject to um, the opinions and the judging of first, of essentially um, a team of grad students and then after that a team of mentors 
So if you do feel strongly about, about what you're working on, I highly recommend you continue to, to work after it. Uh, Sling Health has a lot of resources. We can definitely help you and we want to support all the teams who go through our programs and hopefully we can see some successful companies or NGOs or whatever you might turn into in the future. So yeah, thank you all and I hope you have a great night.